Welcome to the deep dive. Glad to be here. We are plunging right into the uh, the heart of the nuclear energy discussion today. Not just building new stuff, but looking at fuel, fuel innovation. Which is fundamental, really. Totally. And we're zeroing in on one company, the source material highlights. Lightbridge Corporation, ticker LTBR, they're all about advanced nuclear fuel. Right. And the context, as the source notes, is pretty striking. The stock surged, what, over 400% in the last year? Exactly. So our job today is to dig into why the source suggests there's potentially more going on here. We need to pull out the key insights on their technology, how they're testing it, where it fits. And importantly, the hurdles, the risks involved. Yeah. We're basically extracting the narrative from this analysis. OK, let's start with the core technology. The source calls Lightbridge Fuel a ground up redesign. That sounds pretty dramatic. What does that actually mean compared to standard fuel? Well, it's a big departure. Standard fuel, you know, uses those ceramic uranium dioxide pellets. Lightbridge, according to the source, uses a proprietary metallic alloy, zirconium uranium. So different material entirely. Yeah, that's the first big shift. Yeah. And the source also mentions the structure is different too. Right, I saw that, not just cylinders. It's described as twisted, multi-lobed. Exactly, twisted, sort of helix-like. <clears throat> and the source connects these two things, the metallic alloy and the twisted shape, to the performance gains. How so? What's the mechanism? Two key things highlighted. Uh -huh. One, about 35% more surface area because of that shape. And two, much, much better thermal conductivity because it's metal, not ceramic. It just gets heat out way more effectively. Okay, more surface area, better heat transfer. Let's translate that. What are the practical benefits the source claims this offers a power plant operator? This is where it gets interesting, according to the analysis. For new reactors, it suggests potentially up to 30% higher power output. 30%, wow. But what about the reactors we already have? Hundreds of them. That's maybe the more immediate angle. The source claims a 10 to 17% power up rate is possible in existing plants. Okay, hold on. So you could get, say, 15% more electricity from a plant that's already built and running just by changing the fuel? That's the core proposition highlighted, yes. More power without massive new construction. And there's more. Oh, yeah. The source also points to longer fuel cycles, extending them from the usual 18 months to potentially 24 months. Which means fewer shutdowns for refueling, right? More uptime, lower cost. Precisely. More operating days, better economics for the utility. And safety is always the big one in nuclear. What does the source say on that front? This is critical. The metallic fuel apparently runs much, much cooler. Over 1,000 degrees Celsius, lower operating temperatures than standard ceramic fuel. A thousand degrees cooler, that sounds like a massive safety margin increase. It really is. Yeah. And related to that, the source emphasizes that it eliminates the risk of hydrogen generation during an accident scenario. Which was a huge factor in, like Fukushima, right? The hydrogen explosion. Exactly. So removing that specific risk pathway, that's presented as a major potential safety improvement. Okay. What of the back end? The waste? The source claims it produces less plutonium in the spent fuel which, you know, links to reduced proliferation risk, less material of concern being created. So putting it all together from the utility perspective described in the source, potentially more power, longer operation between refueling, significantly higher safety margins, less problematic waste, all without needing a brand new plant. That's the picture the source paints, making the existing global fleet work better, safer, and more profitably. Okay, but an idea like this needs serious validation. Nuclear isn't exactly a move fast and break things industry. The source talks about government support. Yeah, and that's crucial for credibility, not to mention resources. The Department of Energy is highlighted as a key partner. They're supplying the enriched uranium needed for testing. Mm, which isn't trivial to get. Not at all. And providing access to the technical facilities, specifically mentioning Idaho National Laboratory. And there's a big test coming up soon, right? Yes. The source points to reactor irradiation testing scheduled for 2025. That's the key milestone. Putting fuel samples inside the advanced test reactor, the ATR at Idaho Lab. The ATR, okay. And they're using a specific method, FAST, F-A-S-T. Right, fission accelerated steady state test. The significance, according to the source, is speed. Speed in nuclear. Relatively speaking. The source explains FAST uses smaller samples and higher enrichment to basically simulate years of real-world reactor conditions, wear and tear, but in just months. Ah, so it compresses the timeline. Exactly. The insight is that this could potentially shave years off the traditionally very long pathway for qualifying new nuclear fuel. 
that's a potential game changer for development speed. Cutting years off, that would be significant. Is there other validation happening, third parties looking at this? Yes, the source mentions a couple of points adding to the technical picture. Researchers at MIT presented findings earlier this year, 2024, at a major fuel conference. And what did they find? Their analysis, as reported, confirmed the fuel offers superior thermal margins and safety buffers compared to standard fuel. So, an independent academic look backs up those safety claims. Okay, that adds weight. Any look at different reactor types, because not all reactors are the same U.S. design. Good point. The source also mentions work by an institute in Romania, right in ICN. They looked at using Lightbridge fuel in CANDU reactors. CANDU, those are the heavy water reactors, common in Canada, elsewhere. Right. And their study, according to the source, found the fuel could potentially double the energy extracted the burn-up in CANDUs, even using lower enriched uranium than initially thought. Double the burn-up. That's huge for fuel efficiency. Okay, so you've got DOE backing, upcoming ATR tests using an accelerated method, MIT confirming safety margins, and studies suggesting it works well in other major reactor types like CANDU. It builds a picture, as the source presents it, of accumulating technical credibility and potential applicability across a wider market. So let's pivot to that market. The source talks about a huge addressable market. What's the scale we're looking at? We're talking about the global fleet of light water reactors, hundreds of them operating right now. That's the dominant technology worldwide. And Lightbridge's strategy, as described in the source, isn't about competing with companies designing, you know, radically new small modular reactors or molten salt reactors. You know, that's a key distinction the source makes. Their focus is described as being squarely on the existing fleet, improving what's already built and operating reliably today. The source uses this phrase, drop-in upgrade. What does that practically mean for a utility running one of these reactors? It means, in theory, the fuel assemblies are designed to fit into the current reactor core configuration without needing major, expensive re-engineering of the plant itself. So you wouldn't need to rebuild the reactor internals or change major systems. That's the idea. You could, theoretically, slot this new fuel in during a regular refueling outage. Okay, so the advantage the source highlights there is speed to deployment, right? Utilities could potentially get these benefits much faster using their existing assets, rather than waiting maybe decades for a whole new generation of plants to be designed, licensed, and built. Exactly. It's about enhancing the performance of the infrastructure that forms the backbone of nuclear power today. It all sounds incredibly promising on paper. The tech, the validation path, the market focus, but let's get real. Nuclear development is tough. What risks does the source material flag? And it does flag significant ones. The first, right up front, is financial risk. Lightbridge is pre-revenue. Meaning they aren't selling commercial fuel yet. Correct. They're funding everything through raising money, equity financing, and government grants. So there's execution risk they have to hit these technical milestones. And there's the potential for dilution for current investors, as they likely need to raise more capital. Standard for a development stage tech company, but still a major risk. What about the regulators, the NRC? Huge hurdle. The source emphasizes the complexity and length of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's licensing process. It's incredibly rigorous, highly technical even if the tests at ATR go perfectly. Approval isn't guaranteed or fast. Exactly. There's no fixed timeline. The NRC takes the time it needs to ensure safety. It's a, a major uncertainty in terms of timing. Okay. Any other dependencies mentioned? Yes, a specific one. The fuel itself uses something called HAUU, high assay, low enriched uranium. H-A-U-U. Right. That's needed for many advanced reactors, too. It is. And the source points out that the U.S. right now doesn't really have a large-scale commercial supply chain for H-A-U. Yeah. Building that supply chain is crucial, and Lightbridge depends on it becoming available. It could be a bottleneck. Makes sense. You need the special ingredient to make the fuel. What about actually making the fuel itself at scale? That's another challenge highlighted. Scale up. It's one thing to make small test coupons in a lab or even test assemblies for the ATR. It's another thing entirely to manufacture fuel reliably at an industrial scale needed to fuel entire reactors. That requires manufacturing partnerships, quality control, a whole industrial process. Absolutely. And integrating that into a utility's complex fuel management and operations. And finally, even if they clear all those hurdles, funding, licensing, HALU, manufacturing the source, mentions adoption friction. Yeah. Nuclear utilities are, understandably, very conservative. They manage immense assets with huge safety responsibilities. Changing something as fundamental as the fuel type isn't done lightly, even with regulatory approval. 
So even if it's proven safe and effective, utilities might take their time, do their own tests, pilot it slowly. The source suggests commercial adoption will likely be gradual, a step-by-step -step process across the industry, not flipping a switch overnight. It's just the nature of the sector. Okay, let's try to bring this all together. Based only on what the source material tells us, how does it position Lightbridge in the broader nuclear landscape? What's the so what? The analysis frames them uniquely. Not a utility running plants, not mm -hmm. designing exotic new reactors. It describes them as being laser focused on transforming the economics and safety of what already exists. A pure fuel technology play, really. Aiming to upgrade the current foundation of the industry. Precisely. And the key catalysts the source points to, the things to watch. The big ones flagged are that imminent reactor testing in 2025 at the ATR. The potential for that fast methodology and DOE support to genuinely accelerate the validation timeline and just the broader context of accelerating global demand for nuclear power, driving interest in performance improvements. And connecting back to that 400% stock run up, the source seems to suggest that despite that gain, the market might still be underappreciating the potential impact if these catalysts play out favorably. Yes, it frames Lightbridge as, and I'm quoting here, a highly engineered, government supported, catalyst rich fuel platform. It even suggests it could be one of the purest plays on the nuclear revival. What does it mean by purest play in that context? I think the source means their success is tied directly and almost solely to the adoption of this enabling fuel technology, which is needed across the board, rather than being tied to the success of one specific reactor design or the complexities of building and operating plans. It's a focus bet on improving the core component. Okay, so... Stepping back from this deep dive, the source material really lays out this fascinating tension. On one hand, you have this potentially breakthrough fuel tech backed by government support, showing positive signs in early validation, targeting this huge existing market with a clever drop-in strategy. Right, but on the other hand, you have these very, very significant hurdles. The financial reality of being pre-revenue, the long and uncertain path through NRC licensing, the dependence on a nascent HLU supply chain, the massive challenge of industrial scale-up, and the inherent caution of the utility industry itself. It really leaves you thinking. Based on this analysis, as the world looks more seriously at nuclear, what's the faster path to impact? Is it squeezing more performance and safety out of the hundreds of reactors we already have, like Lightbridge is trying to do? Or is the real future in pouring resources into designing and eventually building completely new types of reactors, even if that takes much longer and costs much more upfront? It's a fundamental strategic question about timelines, capital, and how best to leverage nuclear power going forward. Something to really mull over.